Social meeting need not be sad. We celebrate lots of lives. We celebrate a lifetime of work. We celebrate the pathway they have left behind. So today is not going to be a sad day. We are going to celebrate the life of Mr. Muthaya, who on whose shoulders we all stood and saw the history of the city. So first of all, uh, we were very keen that people who had moved with him should come and speak. And uh, we have Anwar with us now. So without much ado, I request Anwar, uh, because Anwar has to finish this and go to his Ramzan uh, uh, prayers. So I request uh, Anwar to start off right now. And we also have Sudha after that. After that, we have a talk on Queen Mary's by Nitya. Thank you. Uh, this has been combinedly hosted by Madras Lo Local History Group and Mystical Palmyra. Uh, good evening to you all. Um, I think um, talking about Mutaya, there are so many areas to be covered, uh, but I'll just quickly recollect to understand this man. Uh, even, I mean, even though I moved with him for 20, 25 years, uh, there have been quite a few areas of his past in which I didn't really know till his death. So for all of us here, I'm just recollecting to understand what he is need to know right from his childhood. We all know, I mean, you might have read that uh, he was born in Pallathur. And he had his house in Karnatakatan, which is the Chetiyar's, uh, Nagratars. Uh, but his education, school education was in Montfort School. And then becomes the most interesting part. It's a convent, Christian convent. He also studied in Lawrence School, not Lovedale which was one of the last books he was doing, but Muri in Pakistan. This is before partition. Okay. And then he moves over to US for his engineering degree. And after finishing his engineering, he moves to study international relations in Columbia University. And then gets back to Sri Lanka, okay, which is where he grew up most of his time. So now I think this kind of places you Mutayas, you know, trajectory, you know, where all he went and what kind of influences he had in making of the man. So from that, you know, if you approach, you know, to, to understand him, it gives a much better vantage point. That's why I gave you this information. And I knew him from 1995 onwards, around 1992. That's when I first met him. And um, I think he was looking for a photographer. I was doing black and white prints. Um, Madras Musings had just started, and he, someone, I was introduced by Devika to Mr. Mutaya, and he liked my gradations, the tonal ranges in my black and white prints. Ranjan Day, who is here, you know, he was one of those who initiated me into black and white prints those days. And um, that's how it started. And Mutaya has many facets, you know, we all know him as, uh, I mean, he doesn't like to be called as a historian. He liked to be called as a chronicler, a heritage enthusiast. He was also a printer. And uh, printing, you know, fascinated him. The days when I met him, he still used to be, people talk about, you know, him sticking to the typewriter. He celebrated a lot of things old. The time when I met him it was the time when the printing industry itself was making a transition from letter offset to multicolor offset. And Mutaya was, you know, very much stuck to the letter offset. He said, you know, you can't get the kind of printing quality that you get in letter offset. And used to compare color uh, prints, books, from what was done letter offset and all that. And it started that way. And that was also a point of time where I was in denial of my own Muslim identity. I think, you know, saying these things are very important here to understand uh, this man. And uh, it, it did not really matter to Mutaya, but Mutaya used to ask me questions. And I had just come from a rural background, and my English was still not that good. I used to very often break into Madurai Tamil. And uh, to my surprise, you know, there are times when Mutaya used to say, you know, I really love listening to your Tamil, you know, that kind of Tamil that I get to listen in Madras. Yours is such so refreshing. And uh, always, you know, found him that, you know, despite his own lack, uh, inability to read Tamil, um, I never found this man to be discriminating in any way. I think he kind of celebrated. He also felt proud to be a Tamil. But there was no discrimination, you know, based on any, be it linguistics or uh, religious or ethnic. That was something absent because of probably the kind of background that he came from. 
and uh, I started working with them. I couldn't do all the photography for Madras Music, but it was not remunerative for me, you know, what they were paying. But I worked on him with on many major commercial projects. You know, he did a corporate, many commissioned books. And that is how our professional relationship started. And one of the very first assignments, major assignments I did, I remember, you know, the personal, professional ethics that this man kind of, you know, taught us. Uh, we were gone to a different place, I mean, uh, further from Madras, and uh, he hosted a dinner to me and another colleague, writer friend. Uh, and the dinner is usual. Now, if you meet Mithaya, if you go during lunchtime, you'll get rasam or more karamba, more or something like that. You go during dinner time, there's a drink, you know, he shares it with you. So, dinner and drinks, and you know, always, you know, ended up with liquor also. He paid for it, and then at the end of it, he said, uh, just one a thing in mind. Uh, when you are being hosted by a client, always ensure that you pay for your drinks. You know, the client can pay for the food, but the drinks has to be borne by you. This is the kind of kind of ethics, you know, this man was instilling in us. You know, I was young and uh, uh, I was not an alcoholic. I was not something, but these are the kind of things that you get to pick up from Mutaya, you know, throughout. I think there was a kind of a journalist in him, which he also, you know, took it along to the professional uh, work he was otherwise also doing. Um, that was a valuable thing. Uh, that apart, uh, when slowly he had this knack of asking questions, I was more proud about my Tamil origins. And I, you know, when you go through school and colleges, you come out with a lot of prejudices and biases, you know. <laughs> a clean mind is kind of corrupted moment you enter into these institutions. And uh, yes, I had my political leanings also. I still, you know, hold my political leanings. And uh, you know the kind of political leanings, you know, in Tamil Nadu was polarized even at that point of time. So I imbibed all that. Uh, but with Mutaya, it was always a no-nonsense approach. You know, you try talking to him like that, he'll immediately put you in place. You know, you try talking about the Tamil heritage, you know, great, greatness of Tamil and all that. And yes, you know, he might not say things in publicly, but when you are with him in private, he said, yeah, you know, you know, the Burmese, their protest, their rebellion was anti-Tamil. You know, their nationalism was not against the colonials, it was against the Tamils. But he celebrated being a Tamil. Let's be very clear on that, you know. These are aspects of history which we are not willing to look at, you know, what the Tamils did. I mean, what the what some people among the Tamils did in Burma, that is something, you know, we need to acknowledge. It's a painful past of our part of our history, but we don't talk about it. And this man, you know, had this knack of putting to it. And I remember 1990, I mean, the Kargil War when it happened. Again, I was tracking all the media and all that. And I said, no, looking, I was looking at the Pakistani media. You know, they are telling all kind of lies, you know, all bullshit. I said, have you read the international media? I said, no. Have, did you read Washington? He quoted a couple of papers and they said, don't think, you know, we are better. Indian media is as equally worse. You know, it's so biased. So just don't go by Indian media reports. So... I mean, patriotism, whatever it is, you know, at the end of the day, he was a journalist. You know, he was looking at things with a very unbiased and critical view. You know, it was the truth that mattered. But he was also conscious, you know, how far he can do. You know, even truth, telling the truth, he was very conscious that he can tell only to an extent, you know. These are intolerant times and not just this, even any time. I think he was very much aware of that. Now, one area that I found him uh, very... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the knowledge that was never used, I feel, is the Sri Lanka. You know, his heart was, despite having done so much on Madras, his heart was in Sri Lanka. And I heard him talk, you know, fondly about the Sri Lanka connections. We all know that, you know, he went back to Sri Lanka and he couldn't, there was the, the ethnicity came in the way of him continuing in the times. And then he came to Madras and took up a job here. And then wherever place you know, he took, he just took to, it, took to the place. He worked with N.S. Ramasamy on the history. And along with that, I think the Madras history kind of you know, grew on him. And then Madras also, the history grew along with him. Um, and this was the point he had also started a little later. He started the Madras musings and a whole lot of things. And then uh, the ABS project, I think that was one of the things, uh, Association of British Scholars. Uh, he got along with them and then decided to do this 
magnum opus, which is the Madras Gazetteer project, you know, uh, 50 different chapters and uh, detailed history of Madras. It's a very ambitious project. And uh, the greatest thing is he lived to see the end of it. You know, that's the thing. It was the last volume was released just about a few months back. And um, that was the time, I, as I said, you know, I was only looking at my Tamil past. And uh, Mutaya and me used to have very often discussions about Sri Lanka, Tamilness and all that. And you say, you know, you guys talk about your Tamil past, you talk about your maritime tradition and all that. Where are the uh, picture, where are the ships? You don't have one image of a ship, you know, what are you talking about? You talk about such maritime past. And that set me actually looking for a ship. And I found it in Tirukurungudi temple, you know, Alayyanambi temple in Tirukurungudi, a bas relief sculpture. And, uh, but in the end, you know, it also took me to my own Muslim heritage. The bas relief sculpture in the Alayya Tirukurungudi temple is of Arab sailors coming for uh, trade to Tamilagam. That, that took me to a fascinating, you know, it opened up newer areas for me. I started looking at the Muslim history and I realized that Tamil Muslim history is completely different. And, when the Madras Gazetteer project happened, the person who was doing the Muslim history dropped in between. And I was, Mutaya, that's the time I was just getting into Mutaya, I said, can you do the Muslim history? And he asked me to write about thousand words. I wrote, he was convinced, and he asked me to go ahead. And then he also said, you know, when you write the Muslim history, I just want you to make ensure that uh, unlike other people who are doing rest of the history for Madras Gazetteer project, for the Muslims alone, I want you to give a background on how Islam came to Tamil Nadu. Because this history is completely different from the North Indian history. So I think you, know, you need to include that and start your Muslim history. And look at, I mean, today we are talking about divisive politics, history is being erased. And here is a man who is bothered about ensuring the Muslim history. And I had come in between, and I, I was also doubtful. I didn't know there was, there was how much Muslim history was there. And he said 15,000 words. Everyone was doing 30,000. Since I had come halfway through the project, he said 15,000 words. I said, you know, I'll do 10,000. He pleaded. And finally, when I ended up, I gave the, something like 40,000 words. And I realized I was only scraping the sur surface. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, why should Mutaya go all out of the way? You know, more than me, he was pleading. He didn't want that history to be left out. Because for me, taking up the project meant, you know, my own commercial work, you know, getting hit. Three years, I have to spend. At least one, another two years, you know, he gave me time to spend on it. And to dig up the history of a community from 1600 to 2000 and then earlier, it was too much for me. But then this man was pleading, you know, without it, this history will go unrepresented. That inclusiveness, it was not just this, you know, Anglo-Indians or anybody. You know, he ensured that he did not treat anyone different. He did not look at, on the other hand, actually, genuinely, you know, looking back, I think that he felt much more happier with the Anglo-Indians and Burgers, you know, in, back in Ceylon. These are two communities I think he felt very much, you know, comfortable home. But also he was, he was very careful that, you know, no one's history ever got left out. You know, that was one thing. That inclusiveness was always there. And... Uh, also, the kind of history also, now when I look back, you know, as we are all paying tribute, when I look back, uh, one thing I've realized is that uh, the kind of history that Mutaya wrote was meant to bring together people. You know, there was never a word said against any particular community or any group of people putting them down. You know, that was not something this man, you know, even though he might knew of facts, but uh, you know that it could always be misconstrued, you know, when you put it on larger media. So he was very, very extremely careful on that. So what he wrote meant, you know, actually it brought to other people. Now that was what Amutaya's biggest contribution is. And he did not wear labels. Yes, Madras was one label that got attached to him. Um, and we know that, you know, how close Madras was to his heart, so much so that, I mean, the name was changed uh, by the DMK government to Chennai. Uh, he wrote a kind of, I mean, he wrote an article criticizing that in his Madras Miscellany saying that what is so Tamil about uh, Chennai? And if these people are talking about Tamil identity, what is so Tamil about uh, Chennai? So I met him the next day. I happened to have some other dealing and I said, uh, sir, to, just to uh, clarify it, 
this is dmk and this dravidian movement and uh, part of dravidian movement telugu is very much part of dravidian movement and some of the leaders are telugus so dravidian movement doesn't discriminate whether it is tamil or telugu and to my surprise was that next week it was there he had reported the same thing mentioning my name anwar came and clarified this and i mean i was taken it, it was very magnanimous of him he did not have really quoted me or i don't even acknowledge that so it was not you know something that yes he had his own and you know, i don't completely say that you know he did not have his biases or anything every one of us you know has have our biases he had a soft corner i would say you know towards a colonial this thing and probably when i look back and today when i look at the many of the history books i think you know mutia also you know had to go through these history books and um, we are given to understand that indians lack a sense of history right you know indians never wrote our history well you know we do not talk about the inscriptions you know we do not look at our literature literature is history each society has its own way of writing its history our sangam literature is history it's not just about tamil it's not about poetry it's it's also our history you know if you look at all the literary work that are done that is also our history but somehow you know this disconnect had come probably the western oriented thing you know we had imbibed in ourselves and thought that you know we don't have a recorded history. history like the others have we are a subcontinent and you know the other european societies if you look at it they are more monotheistic societies so probably you know they could kind of write just like the sinhalese you know wrote their own thing but mutia never had uh, those sort of things and uh, as i said you know his closest thing was sri lanka and that was one thing that i regret that he, that expertise was never made use of and uh, we had long discussions on the ethnic conflict sri lankan ethnic conflict and operation ceasing wave unceasing waves all that you know we spoke about 3 uh, 4 years back i realized that his knowledge on sri lanka need to be actually made use of I called a couple of close friends and you know that in the polar even the sri lanka issue is even today the elam whatever now we call it as today even today is a troublesome issue to talk in the public and so i call for a closed door meeting with a few journalists you know for mutia to talk and it was a memorable i wish you know he was there to do such a thing here uh, and only thing is he would have not agreed to with being videotaped but uh, he started off from the central highlands and how the demographics you know from there starts and how the tamil forces were used in the 12th or 13th century by vijay bahu to unite the entire sinhalese entire sri lanka and how the tamils you know got assimilated into the sinhalese uh, identity in the sri lankan society you know they became part of the sinhalese so much so they got positions and all that and this assimilation kept on happening and he had pointers you know how the malayalis went in much later how the 19th century when the colonialists went how the chettiars went in over there and then the tea gardens came up and then the laborers went and the, the kind of information that he had was like he knew nooks and corners of sri lankan this thing and that was a and and, and thing is he was even today till i think till the last minute he was keeping in touch his old sri lankan friends were sinhalese friends or whatever they were keeping in touch they were dropping in on him and he had the news during the war he will be up to date with what was happening in the war because he had his sources people were talking to him and but so that gave me i mean one of the prejudices i had was removed when i you know kept having these chats with mr mutayya and i started pre- previously it was like i looked at the sinhalese as an enemy but after talking with mr mutayya and having these long conversations you know i slowly started getting rid of my biases i think this is one thing that he imbibed in people who worked with them all all the people who worked with him more than that uh, even though today he might be on i mean in a way i'm glad that the era, the easter bombings happened after his death that would have really tore him apart you know that would happened before his death and uh, but looking back at uh, mr mutia's legacy i would say that uh, uh, he has made enormous contributions and if you look at the institutions that he has built he has made in contributions to number of organizations here you know be it roja mutia research library or intac um, prsi uh, number of institutions like that madras musings is another thing that's going to be continuing and madras day you know vincent is there they st- started as a one day event and then what it has grown and i'm sure you know vincent can talk about it the reason why it grew was that this man never took it as it's my own it's i am the one who brought it 
there was always this team building. You know, it was always meant for people, you know, you criticize, you know, you are also welcome to, you know. Madras Day did not, does not belong to me. You want to organize an event, you know, please go ahead and organize. And Madras Book Club again, if you take a look at Madras Book Club, he realized that, you know, the conflicts will come if you make someone as president and then there is money involved. Now there is going to be people, you know, fighting for organizational posts and all that. So Madras Book Club, you know, kind of, it, it functions in a way that there is no this kind, kind of a you know, president, you no know, secretary, but it still continues to function. You know, that is the kind of organization that he has built. And uh, lastly, I would say that, uh, yes, you know, he, did, he was not known as an environmentalist or a, uh, developmental journalist. But if you read Madras Musings carefully, you know, you will find a mark of all that. He was questioning the kind of developments that are happening in Chennai. You know, is this really sustainable? You know, can can this city afford these kind of developments? You know, these flyovers are these things necessary. He was not talking about just maintaining old buildings or heritage buildings. You know, that that was not the only thing. He was also talking about a development and inclusive development. I remember when pavement dwellers were being uprooted. You know, from I think uh, Paris corner. Now they wanted to clean up the place and Mutia, you know, told, you know, I, and he said, you know, I heard someone say that uh, because of the payment uh, dwellers, I mean, these uh, shopkeepers in the payment, there is things like pickpocket, you know, those kind of crimes don't happen in that area because the payment shopkeepers know that if that happens, that will affect their business. So you also need to look at, you know, these sort of things. This is the kind of inclusiveness, you know. It was not a corporate driven thing and all that. It was like you need development for everybody. That is the legacy of this man. And uh, even though I feel sad that, you know, I won't be meeting him, I'm glad that, you know, he has left behind institutions and he has made us all proud. Uh, I'm sure if he had been in Madurai, he would have still written volumes about Madurai because it's a much older city. In Kanchipuram, the same thing. In fact, 10 years back, I remember he was actually considering writing about the whole of Tamil Nadu. But the thing is, there was his column, which had gone to about 973 or something, uh, had become a mutual thing where people were supplying information to him. And it kept on going. So, uh, and I think what he had started, the ABS, yes, it's not all historians work, but uh, I also, you know, having dealt with many historians, I know that they are very picky and picky about, you know, what facts to put and they debate and all that. And today you have something like ABS, the Madras Gazetteer, you know, in front of you, 50 different chapters, you know, which will be, I'm sure, for future generations to work on. I'm sure there are mistakes, you know, that need to be corrected. As we go learn, as more new facts come, like Madrasapatnam, there is a inscription that has been found somewhere in uh, northern Tamil Nadu. As these comes, you know, these things can get updated. And Madras discovered itself, you know, got rediscovered. And every time, you know, it was being upgraded. So that was always there. And uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, despite this thing that this man has done so much to the city and he has left behind a legacy about which we are all proud of. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I never uh, was that close to Muthaya. Just a couple of times I would have met him, or three times. But he came for the uh, Madras Club talk on World War that I gave. And uh, Arvind Vasu, Stiti Vasu's son, took us all for dinner. And uh, Muthaya's usual scotch. And uh, for one hour, the word that uh, Anwar said, pleading. Muthaya was pleading to me, literally pleading to me, get out of Madras history. He just listened to one and a half hours of my talk, not a word about that. He said, get back to Devakota. I come from Devakota. He said, there's a lot of work to be done in Devakota. Ten years down the line, you won't have any person to give you oral history or the building standing because he knew about my background. He said, get back. That is something that you ought to do. The Madras history, it's not your forte. You should go and do that. But I something, it's my regret I never followed that. Then another famous, uh, I have the thing that I would always remember was my father collects typewriters. And Madras uh, is miscellany. He wrote a, a you can still, uh, Olivetti, he, my father collects only Olivetti uh, typewriters. And he wrote a big article about a man who has a typewriter wherever he goes. That was the first time I met Mr. Muthaya to give him the photographs. Uh, now we have uh, Sudha, another close associate of Mr. Muthaya, to share her opinions on the great man. Uh, 
good evening everybody and thank you very much uh, venkatesh for this uh, opportunity to pay tribute to mr mutheya much uh, loved and respected teacher of mine like venkatesh said we all have uh, really stood on his shoulders and uh, he he was the go to person for everything uh, about madras uh, you you mentioned the word madras or history or heritage and uh, instantly the the connect is made to to uh, uh, mr mutaya and his uh, uh, madras discovered is a bible for all uh, heritage uh, lovers i first met mr mutaya in 1985 when i had uh, signed up for a part time uh, j- uh, journalism course at the bharatiya vidya bhavan and uh, the classes at do- in those uh, days were held at takar baba uh, vidyalaya and uh, every tuesday we would have uh, mr mutaya teaching us uh, reporting he would arrive in his uh, uh, premier padmini i think it was 60 30 or something and um, and uh, he he was the kind of man who had complete uh, complete uh, he was in complete command of his subject uh, no notes uh, no referring to any files or anything hands in his uh, trouser pockets he would pay, pace uh, the floor of the of the class and he would keep us uh, engrossed Uh, we would be unmindful of the odd mosquito buzzing around our heads in uh, takar baba vidyalaya because we were glued to what he was saying and uh, he would really ha- uh, keep us uh, spellbound he would teach us about news he would tell us that uh, you know if a dog bites man it's not news but if a man bites dog you know that that's the kind of news that you should be looking at <laughs> and um, uh, you know he would talk about the character characteristics of of a news item he would talk about immediacy he would tell us that you know if a plane crashed in uh, new york it's not really of uh, too much uh, interest to uh, madrasis but then if there were madrasis on board or if there was a celebrity indian on board then immediately there is you know a sense of immediacy a sense of connect and he would give us little tips about how to make uh, you know a news item interesting he said uh, let's say you're in uh, interviewing a, a film star or a top notch a uh, female musician uh, t- tell us what color her sari was was she wearing flowers in her hair you know he's these are the little things that he would remind us that would make any uh, news report uh, interesting and um, uh, he he also cautioned us about all the pitfalls in the english language he would always tell us it's not nooks and corners it's nooks and crannies he <laughs> hated anybody using the word you know prepon this is a kind of <laughs> this is a kind of uh, you know learning that we had at the feet of this uh, master he he knew uh, almost all his students by name and he would take a keen interest even after we had left the portals of the bhavan he was always very interested in what we were doing and even as as the course was coming to an end he wanted me to go to a side magazine with, with which he was very closely associated in those days because he were uh, he was uh, closely um, working closely with uh, abraham irali so he wanted me to go to a side magazine for my internship since i was already writing for freelancing for a side magazine i told him that i sir that with a lot of trepidation i told him i would uh, rather go to to the indian express sir and i was i was thinking that he's just going to take off uh, when i said that but to my surprise he was he was completely understanding and, and he he gave me the go ahead and that's how i went to train uh, in in the indian express he talked fondly uh, like uh, anwar the previous uh, speaker mentioned he had his education in a number of countries and he talked very fondly of his years at Worcester Massachusetts which is where he did his uh, uh, engineering uh, degree 
and um, Mutaya seemed to have showed promise as a journalist even in those days because he was very active as a uh, as a campus uh, journalist and he was a campus stringer for all the city newspapers and he would talk fondly of the community newspapers i see you know vincent uh, here and his mylapore times you know had ha, has become so so popular and well read mr mutaya was very very fond of these uh, community uh, newspapers he he always used to talk of the hindu as the mount road mahavishnu which was uh, always uh, projecting itself as a national newspaper whereas in those days in the in the 80s uh, mid 80s it was the indian express that was covering a lot of uh, local news so he would point us in, in all these directions and uh, he uh, he would take keen interest he would he would advise even without our asking he would tell us you know where we should turn or or what we should uh, you know pursue and as i said uh, he was very active as a campus uh, uh, journalist and he was inducted into uh, the first asian to be uh, inducted uh, admitted into the honor society for campus uh, journalism so he showed uh, promise uh, very very early on there was one more uh, subject that we had at the bharatiya vidya bhavan and uh, we could choose between printing and uh, pr and i opted for printing which was handled by mr mutaya and uh, this meant uh, more hours with mr mutaya so he took us to a printing press and uh, uh, like anwar mentioned he was uh, completely fascinated by the letter press and he, he showed us how how things work in in a in a printing press so it was absolutely you know uh, it was a great opportunity for us to actually see how all these things were being done and occasionally he would also uh, invite students over to his home where he would uh, you know give us uh, additional inputs Mr Mutaya had uh, you know uh, back in those days uh, if you uh, think back and uh, you know recall there was no google no internet uh, no nothing uh, i i mean one had to do research the the hard way go out sit in uh, libraries pour over uh, books talk to people and and that is how you know he did all his research and he had a great appetite for uh, anything related to to whatever he was writing about so if you uh, walked into his house at any time he would be sitting there in the living room with stacks of books and you know all uh, uh, many uh, papers uh, scattered all around him and if he wanted to uh, you know uh, cut out any uh, any news item he wouldn't bother looking for a pair of scissors or a paper cutter or anything he would just randomly fold the paper and just tear it any which way and you know put it away and then he would look uh, at us and smile and say uh, one of these days my wife is going to throw me and all the you know uh, stuff out of the house because that was how much he was he was uh, collecting and storing information he would also uh, he, uh, he, he had a very uh, uh, you know supportive wife in many ways and he would tell us i have a very young and energetic wife because she's almost 20 years younger than him he married uh, very late um uh, bali was her name and she was a comp- uh, company secretary a very spirited uh, lady uh, the perfect uh, foil to uh, mr mutaya and uh, so he would always acknowledge uh, that you know it was it was very easy for him to pursue whatever he wanted because he had had such a young and energetic wife who took care of almost everything uh, in the house as as young students we were all simply in awe of his prolific you know uh, output and we used to wonder how on earth is this man able to you know produce uh, you know release book after book after book and so one day i asked him i said sir just how do you manage to do it and he said that's simple i only i make it a point that i write 1000 words a day so he made it uh, that simple but but he was absolutely disciplined and focused 
Of course, he would go uh, out to the uh, to the Madras club every evening uh, for a little gossip. He would say because he um, he got a lot of uh, uh, news from friends and uh, people he met at the club and uh, at other places. And I remember once I started doing work on Harrington Road, there were people who used to think I was some kind of postman. There's one gentleman who used to send me, you know, stuff, or whatever he wanted to to be reached. Mutaya, it would all arrive in my inbox, and I was expected to, you know, uh, forward this to Mr. Mutaya. And whatever he used, like Anwar said, he would always acknowledge the source. He loved good pictures. When I remember when I stumbled on a picture of the Palmen Bridge and I sent it to him. He he was I could almost sense the excitement because he used it in Madras uh, musings, and he also immediately uh, uh, gave uh, credit. So he he was he was a kind of person who never hesitated to give credit where it was due. And after he passed on, I I have been thinking, wh- what is it about this man? that uh, that ma- makes him you know so so well loved and i think that it's all because he had so much of grace he had so much of uh, culture he was warm he was friendly he was welcoming he encouraged uh, people to grow and he never ever failed to give credit wherever it was uh, due and like i said he was always you know wanting to know what you were working on what is the project that you're working on and who are you writing for and uh, and if you told him what you were working on he would turn pensive for a few minutes and then he would come up with some very remarkable insights i mean he won't he wouldn't say too much but then what he said you know would really lead you on to something uh, very very interesting I remember when we were doing the the Alumni Association of Church Park was doing the history hundred year history of the of the Church Park convent. Um, he had wanted me to do the, the first uh, first chapter, and uh, and he said get in as much social history as possible. This was something that Mr. Mutaya was very very fond of social history. What 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 were the times like? Uh, what was the education scene like? Was the Gurukulam system in mode? Who were the takers for the convent uh, kind of education? Uh, when did the Irish arrive? And what about the missionaries? You know, he would fit everything into a much larger framework uh, that really opened a, a lot of uh, windows for us. And after that chapter was done. He made sure that I uh, I ran it by uh, a person that he uh, had uh, established contact with in uh, at the arch uh, uh, diocese of uh, Mylapore just to make sure that there was uh, no factual errors. And biography as history is another thing that he was very very fond of. He always felt that each of us should write our own life histories. He said, maybe not for publication, but at least for our families, for our children and grandchildren to read it, to to find, to understand what uh, times were 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 like. And uh, he even suggested that I should write about my days at the Bhavan. And uh, talking about the corporate uh, histories and all the other, you know, work that he had done, he 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 remarked that. Uh, the the uh, things the, the perspective that he gave about sri lanka in his books he said that was very different from what you would get in an academic or uh, scholarly textbooks so he said that that view is very very important and and whatever corporate history or you know any, any other history he insisted must be recorded because it will soon be forgotten and then uh, and uh, if you don't record it at that point in time it will be forgotten and there is a lot to be learned uh, from whatever uh, you know history that we record and um, of course he also insisted that as historians we should do our fact checking and uh, you know uh, uh, you, you, uh, you know double check facts 
because you can easily be, uh, you know, make make a fool of yourself. He once uh, shared the example of uh, of a Western author who wrote about Nagratar Chetiyars, and uh, he had included uh, Kanaya Chetty in his uh, in his uh, you know list of Chetiyars, and then he uh, he laughingly said. Um, Kanaya Chetty is a Komti Chetty, not a Nagratar uh, Chettyar. And this Western author had, uh, you know, uh, made this uh, mistake. And uh, he, while he wrote extensively about uh, Chettyar heritage, uh, Mr. Mutaya once told me, he said, I'm a very bad Chettyar. He said, I know nothing about money or business. My focus is on the business of storytelling. And uh, that is what I do best. Uh, he said, even if I'm writing a corporate history uh, about a Chetiyar company, I won't get into financials or economic theory or anything. I would only refer to it peripherally. Uh, like, for instance, if I, if I were to, you know, comment, he, he would say that if I were to comment on, on why Paris uh, closed down, the, uh, you know, had an issue with the sanitary wear division, I would look into whether... Uh, it was because they didn't get the design right or whether it was a, a design more suitable for the Western uh, clientele or whether people did not want to not squat. What was that? He said he, I would go into things like that rather than get into uh, numbers and uh, economic theory and, you know, the rest of uh, all that. Uh, uh, his two daughters, uh, Ranjini and Parvati, they, they are very well qualified. And, uh, you know, when Mr. Mutaya's wife passed away, he, he was literally uh, shattered. I remember going to pay my condolences to him and he wept and he said, uh, I don't even know where the keys are in the house. Because she sort of ran the house on well-oiled wheels. But I think the girls were amazing, and so were their husbands and children. And and uh, those of us who worried how Mr. Mutaya will ever come out of this, uh, you know, uh, saw that they they helped him to to cope by visiting him uh, very often, rearranging things around the house, and uh, you know, getting him back to doing whatever he liked uh, uh, doing best. He had a, a publication firm, uh, which was an, uh, you know, uh, which was a combination of their two names. It was called Ranpar Publishers, and whatever books, many of Mr. Puteya's books are out of print. So Ranpar uh, Publishers was formed from their two names, and uh, a couple of uh, titles came out uh, uh, under that, uh, 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 you know, firm, and I hope many more of. Uh, you know, Mr. Mutaya's titles, which are not, uh, uh, you know, available, will uh, soon be uh, uh, reproduced. And then he also very mischievously added, he said, one of my girls uh, actually has a flair for writing, but my wife has brainwashed her into not becoming a writer because there's no money in writing. So, <laughs> so he knew exactly... Uh, you know uh, what it was uh, all about. So, uh, in, in sum, I want to say uh, he has left us a glorious uh, legacy uh, and something that we can all be proud of and something we should really uh, build on. And that he did it with all the constraints that he had uh, in, in his time makes it uh, all the more remarkable. Uh, and I'm sure he he wouldn't want us moping and uh, uh, you know um, get, making ourselves miserable, but really celebrating his life and uh, and uh, and carrying on uh, the good work to to preserve whatever heritage is left uh, of uh, Madras that is also Chennai. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kumbhai Anwar and uh, Sudha Uma Shankar, for paying such good tributes, rich tributes to a man who brought Chennai so closer to us. But for Mutaya, Mr. Mutaya, I don't think Namak Madraspati would have it's a, uh, it's a billion dollar question. That is how much that man has contributed uh, uh, to Chennai. 
and uh, madras local history in fact is very fortunate you know uh, to uh, pay a tribute to that man thank you so much both of you and uh, as usual we get into our uh, regular monthly talks so this month uh, we have about kune uh, marys the talk this is by madras local history and mystical palmara group this is a monthly series lecture which we have been doing it since uh, last august after the madras day where we found you know this uh, we thought it is be more appropriate to do, to have talks on chennai because what happens is once uh, people do this on august then they just forget about uh, chennai appra ella nan enna nenchukranga next august independence day meda madras nenchukranga so we thought it is more appropriate to have it every month so we been doing this since uh, last august so this month you know uh, the topic is on kun meris the speaker is nithya balaji is a chairperson of nalamdana trust chennai a non executive post since 2009 she had did a schooling from church park convent and graduated from uh, kun meris uh, she did her uh, graduation in geography anal da iniki vandu kun meris pathiye pesranga avanga so she has worked in an ad advertising and creating departments as an english copywriter retired as a director in mcs communication private limited have had wide experience in print and radio television creating special events and promotion promotional literature and a wide variety of fields then she moved to mass media to an alternative media when uh, nalamdana was founded in 1993 the ngo works on behavior change communication using entertainment education nitya has traveled widely related to nalam Nalamdana work and presented research papers and findings in international conferences. She is a keen traveler and very interested in heritage and local history. She is often invited to present and speak on issues related to heritage, music, communication, etc. Went to her alma mater. That's what I am going to talk about. QMC in two thousand four, two thousand five, and became involved in the World Students Committee. Has helped in editing and producing the QMC centenary commemorative volume along with a close knit group of college mates. Feels passionately, passionately. about poor maintenance of this college continues to study women's issues public health issues art and sculpture she is also trained at carnatic music and veena have dabbled in select sports rowing golf and table tennis amateur artist member of chennai weekend artist so and she has she is a mother of one that is what i've said a gender swalla <laughs> so we yeah and uh, may i request uh, nitya balaji to take over the stage and welcoming you on behalf of madras local history and mystical palmira thank you so much Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am really delighted to be able to talk about my old college. We'll wait for the screen to cooperate. It's. I mean, can I quickly ask? Are there any Queen Marians in this auditorium? One, two. Vincent, Queen Marian. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay that's what i mean I, you might be having a mother grandmother aunt uncle i mean aunts in fact uncles too because in the first few years they had a lot of men lecturers okay coming to my first like the queen of marina was the title given for me to talk on queen mary's college this was started in july 14 1914 you know every time we talk about qmc we we have wondered whether this was the very first college for women and mr muttaya had explained beautifully in his hindu metropolis january 27 1914 isabella thorburn started the first college for women in lucknow 1886 sara tucker upgraded a school in palayam kottai in 1895 
and QMC was the only college for women started by the government. So we go to the next slide. Thank you. So a walk down memory lane. This is Kappa House. Take a good look at this strange looking building. It already existed. It's possibly the oldest residential building on the marina, 1800s. This is deeply imprinted in every Queen Marian's heart because this was the building that we all related to. It has, uh, it has been a hostel. It has been the very first day of the college year. It was started only in this building. Next one. Who was Kappa? He was a Lieutenant Colonel Francis Kappa, who was a renowned geographer. So isn't it a fantastic coincidence that this is the college, about the only college, I think, which offers geography as a main course, apart from Presidency College. Uh, he actually lived in this house, and he later sold it, and Sir Ratna Sabapati of Arcot bought it, along with 15, 16 acres of adjacent land. Now note that that's a very, it's going to play an important part in the later history of the college. Later, this place was rented out as a hotel, and on 14th of July, it got renovated by the government to start an experimental college for women. Next slide. This is Dorothy De La Hay. Dorothy De La Hay was born in England. She actually studied history at Oxford, but she was not given a degree because those days Oxford did not believe women should be given degrees. On a visit to her brother's house in Madras, she gets persuaded to inspect a site by Lord Pentland, who was a very close friend of her brother. So he had met her, at, I think, socially. And there, there was already a move for a college for women on an experimental basis. So she gets persuaded to come and inspect the site. She, she, she hired or she, she drove the buggy, which belonged to her brother, down Edward Elliot's Road, which would have been a mud track 100 years ago. And she turns into this. Uh, compound and sees a rundown building, which is Kappa House. And she said, it will do. It's got a lot of space. It's facing the sea, so it might be quite good. And she gets persuaded to stay and start the college. First, she's very, uh, I mean, she's not very happy to do it because she was there on a holiday and she wanted to go back. But she's persuaded to stay. Uh, yeah. So it was started on the 14th of July. Uh, she, she agrees to start the college. And on the very first day, there is this beautiful book by Old Students Association, OSA, a very precious copy which I got uh, from the college and scanned it in Roja Mutaya and paid for a single copy to be printed for me, uh, I mean, for our team to make the book. In that, she describes how the workmen were hammering away and there was no blackboard, no chalk. That was the first day of the college. And about 30 people or 40, 30 people who had applied, all of them had been admitted because the government was keen to prove that there, there, there is a need for a college for women. And she has quoted her own principle, saying it is better for our college to begin in a humble way and grow to burst its shell rather than strive to fill a huge shell already made. And so true it became because very soon more and more girls were joining and from all over and they had to expand and take more buildings. This is a very rare picture of the three central buildings of Pentland block, the furthest away. Middle one is Jaipur block and this end is stone block. Pentland was named after Lord Pentland, who was very, very uh, helpful in starting of the college and for the building. This came up uh, in uh, 1915. And 1918 was stone block. And in the middle, there was nothing for a long time. Then Jaipur block came up with a generous donation of the Raja of Jaipur, under which they built the in-between block. There's again very interesting articles in this book saying how from this block to the last block, when there was nothing in between, all the girls had to wade through water. Because you can see the water, how close it is, and the embankment, there is no wall. So this picture came from my uncle's album, actually, my Chitapa. 
because my my grandmother's sister was one of the first students who got enrolled. So the home Albert Lane, we got this. Uh, and once the Jaipur block had come up, there was again a generous donation from the Raja of Panagal. And um, the, uh, the sculpture uh, was, uh, th th that is S. Nagappa, was asked to make a bust of the queen. And this beautiful marble bust was put in the central hall of the college. Very soon, Lots of girls, I mean, nobody knew who this Queen Mary was or anything, perhaps, I mean, at, at the lower levels, but, but they all identified with this person because she, there was a woman looking very grand right there in the middle of the hall. And uh, when we were digging for the facts to bring out this book, I saw a beautiful picture of Queen Mary with a baby on her lap with a lovely frock. And that is our Queen Elizabeth of today. So she's the grandmother of the current Queen of Britain. They, of course, had taken over the beach house, which was uh, one of the very old houses there. And uh, it, it was being used for various classes and later as hostel. And there was a warden who had to live there and be with the girls. In fact, this college was the hostel for many other colleges because there were no hostels for the other lady uh, in, in institutions at that time. So medical college, uh, Lady Willington, Presidency College, all of them stayed in QMC hostel. So there is a lot of uh, uh, interaction between all these girls, even on, in those days. More courses were started. Uh, but this is the state of that building today. Just look at it. It's almost falling apart, and, this, and the ceiling has caved in. Nothing has been done about it. Government, who is in charge of the government colleges, uh, turning a blind eye. They just paint it once a year, because when there is a march past for Independence Day, it shows up in the TV. So they, only the outside gets painted. The inside is left. This is an artist impression of the same building. It's really overgrown and sad. And something can surely be done. And a lot of effort is, has been made, is still being made. But there is this very rigid rule. Government, na, PWD only can do. Nobody else can come and do anything. So this kind of rules really break the heart of most of the students. This college. If you, it started in 1914, immediately World War, Nalavarsho. Then it saw the Second World War. Then it saw India's independence struggle. And then it saw the uh, qu qu Quit India movement. So it's be, it has it had a ringside view of the entire history. And in 2003, there was a grave threat to the college. Sorry. Here we have, I mean, I must talk about the spirit of this college. There's something special in Q QMC, because we were allowed to be adults. They never locked the gates. You can check with any Queen Marian. No, we could bunk classes. They would take attendance every hour. And if you bunked, and if you roamed, and you didn't know your lessons, that's your own hard luck. And if you didn't have enough attendance, you can't sit for the exam. So we were forced to become responsible. So there was no over, overbearing uh, controls. And we've all had so much of fun, and so much of, uh, you know, I've cut class and roamed around. And there was this beautiful blue, blue diamond theater, which just opened. We could walk in any time and watch the movies. So in the Mari, you know, we really enjoyed our college life. And we met so many girls from different states and different languages, and we all got together so well. We have here Swarnambal, who was number seven in the admission list. She's the first Hindu. She's my grandmother's younger sister. She did chemistry, and she taught chemistry. And she was a warden. And she stayed with the girls in that house. Here you have a mixture of all the, all the hostel girls with the warden. 
if you notice, many of them are wearing frocks and looking very Western. And there's a mixture of Indian people in saris. These are the first three graduate girls from Ice House. They were all child widows. Amukuti, Lakshmi, and Parvati. Uh, yes, Lakshmi Ammal became a lecturer in QMC. For many years, she taught there. Amukuti was a teacher in a government school in Coimbatore. Parvati joined a, a school in Salem later. So you, you can imagine how forward they must have been, how lucky they were to escape from the terrible torture of being child widows, get educated, go out and become educators themselves. This was a sketch done by a friend of mine for, for the magazine. I believe there were no labs for chemistry and physics in QMC up till 1929. So girls had to go to Presidency College for practicals. Up at Jatka Vandila, they would go because they had asked the principal, how will we get there? We are spending our own money. You have to do something. So the government gave some money. And there were Jatka Vandis there. And all of them would climb in and go in batches. And one day, one of them decided to drive it because that driver was very slow. So it ran wild on Marina. So that is being described in one of the articles. And I thought that was so lovely. So we had that sketch done. Miss Steela Hay was so forward looking, you know, she was very keen that all the girls should come regardless of their background. So she had separate prayer halls for Hindus, Christians, Muslims, and then they had their own uh, kitchens because it was a big thing, you know, the food. So there were caste based kitchens, four or five different eating places. Then slowly over the years, these blended and became only three. So the girls themselves started uh, I mean, there, there was no, uh, I think, even to start with, they wouldn't have minded. But the families won't send the girls to study unless you follow all these things. So that is what happened. This is a picture of farewell to Dila Hay. The entire college is assembled in this picture with Miss Dila Hay sitting in the middle. There are 250 girls on the rolls then and 180 in the hostel. There were three sections only. So that six sections had become three sections by 1935. And Ms. Dila had retired three years before her actual date. And she took up some other work in Anglo-Indian schools. And she was succeeded by Ms. Myers. This is a picture of her in the principal's office, which hangs. Because 20 years she gave of her life to put this college together. She, she also used to know every girl by name, and she would visit them. You know, all of them who had studied and gone out and taken up jobs, she would travel all over India and visit them. And she would also travel outside. Her family, we somehow two or three of them came visiting to the college, and we met them when we were meeting for the centenary. And all of them, about four of them came and attended the function. One of them was uh, Donald Dila Hay who was very keen to know how his father was shot dead. He was the son of that gentleman who ran the college for the princess, princess school. So he actually joined us on one of our mystical Palmyra trips and uh, came to see Singampati Jameen, I think, and saw the picture of that man. And he said, now I have closure. So that was a very moving thing for me. Uh, I had also gone for that trip. Uh, they're a wonderful family and they have actually contributed and they have a huge lump sum waiting in England. They want to give it to QMC to start something in memory of Dila Hay. And we don't know how to go about it because there is no responsible person who can give assurance, yes, we will do something, this will be done, and this is the way to transfer the money. <coughs> so that's where it stands. Second World War, India's own struggle. There's a lot of articles in our book taken from those periods and it shows how the how miss myers would would be very diplomatic because the girls wanted to go out and join the protest and march so she would say you just sign the registry and you go and do what you like if you come back before 6 you will be allowed into the college if you don't come back before 6 stay with a guardian that's it so she handled it directly it never went to the government because it was a dicey thing they were anti government yeah and this is a government college and she's appointed by the government so that that is mrs myers i mean about her and a little bit about the extraordinary students from queen mary's there are so many it's difficult to pick so i picked only two or three 
and I hope the rest of them will forgive me. We have, you know, all the people who came and did intermediate two years, they would go to medicine. So we have Captain Lakshmi Sargal. She was Lakshmi Swaminathan, Ammu Swaminathan's daughter. And she did medicine and she joined Bose and she became, uh, she, she, she was captain of the Rani Jansi regiment. Uh, she, she fought in the war. She was, uh, I think, held prisoner at the end of it in Delhi. By the time we got our independence, so she was released. She met Sahgal at the prison, and then they got married. Then she was also very active afterwards. So that is all the high uh, awards given to her up to Padma Vibhushan in 1998. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay was also a student. Uh, she, I don't know exactly what she did. Uh, she, she must have done her graduation, then she got married to Chatupadhyay. Before that, she got into a lot of crafts and arts, as you know, and she started some of the most outstanding institutions in our country, as you can see. I don't like to read what is there already. Then we have lesser known people, but brilliant, absolutely. Dr. E.K. Janaki Ammal, who was a world-renowned botanist. See, she's done BA honors in QMC, and later higher studies, then she's been a teacher, a researcher, and uh, then she's worked as a psych cytologist in London Royal Horticultural Society. She organized the Botanical Survey of India. Like you have ASI, you have BSI, and then that is split into four sections, which she did. Then she discovered a small variety of magnolia, which was named after her in England. It's called Magnolia Cobus Janiki Amal. <laughs> And in Calcutta, they had a huge event. And it was reported in the papers. There was an exhibition. And we, we hardly know her. I mean, it's so sad. We, I, I met her grandniece. And uh, she came and told me, and she took a book. Uh, amazing lady, amazing lady. Then the first Indian principal, I haven't put a photo of her because I don't like the photo. She's such a fantastic person when you read about her that the photo is so bad, it doesn't do justice. I mean, not that she has to look good, but it's clear away. She's the sister of Muthu Lakshmi Reddy. So her name is Nalla Muthu, and she married Ramamurthy. Nalla Muthu was, I mean, the, I think the whole family was in, uh, was not in Madras, and when Muthu Lakshmi got the seat for medicine, they moved to Madras. Then she joined. PT school in Egmore, and she was a student of Sister Subbalakshmi, who was teaching there. One of the essays she wrote, why we need a college for women. I've been over essay, this, that won a prize. So the, somebody from the governor's council visited them, and she was asked to read out the essay, which she did. And then he said, what college for women? If we open it, how many of you will join? Then the whole class put up their hand. So he was quite shaken, then he went away. So this must have happened in 1913, according to the records of Monica Felton's book. Then 1914, all these things happened and it got open. So she's also joined. She's number 14 in the first admission list. Then she uh, taught in Queen Mary's. Then she went abroad. And uh, I, I, have, I must read that bit. She did inter in QMC, graduated and post-graduation in presidency, higher studies in England, taught in QMC, left for England and joined Harold Lasky School of Economics. She studied child psychology, worked in the League of Nations. She attended the Paris Conference in 1926. She became the first Indian principal in 19... Sorry. And she, she, she introduced many new ideas once she became principal. She, it, it was she who started NCC for girls. She actually retired in 1950 to work in Avvai home, which, was, which had been started by her sister and which had moved to Adyar. She married Mr. Ramurthy, who came from a very uh, uh, orthodox Brahmin family. And of course, the, it was not uh, accepted by that family. Muthu Lakshmi Reddy got them married in a Brahmo Samaj ceremony. Uh, so it was a love marriage. They, they didn't have any children, but they were so devoted. They have a school in his name in, inside Hawaii home campus even today. So she was an amazing person. This is a list of principles taken from the uh, centenary book. 
Please note among the principals, the longest Indian principal was Dr. Airavati, who was an ardent geographer and uh, also a very hardworking principal. Many of these older principals stayed on the premises of the college and they, they would look after so many aspects of the college. They, they, I would like to mention one brave principal called Deep Padmini, who was an old student and who was there in 2003 when the college was threatened. Then Eugenie Pinto, who was there in 2005 to 2007, with whom I had a lot of interaction and uh, we could do a lot of work in the college. 2003, crucial time, worrying times. 2003, the government of the day wants to shift the college and build a secretariat for the act for, for the ruling principal of the, I mean, C CM of that time. <laughs> Being a lady, she wants to wreck the women's college. So Kappa House is allowed to fall down. Bulldozers arrive, power and water is cut off, and the students and principals are asked to vacate. Padmini was the pr principal and she said no. All the students said we won't move. The teachers opted to stay. Then word spread and a lot of old students gathered and slowly it built up and there were a lot of protests and there, there was very stiff resistance. If they came out of the college, the bulldozers would come and break. And they stayed. So there's a night vigil with candles, all the, all, all the students and teachers. This side you have the OSA, that is the old students gathering. In the middle is Olive Paul who was 90 years old. So many old students came. I was there thanks to Tara who dragged me on the first day and after that I kept going. I couldn't stop. You know, the amazing thing was Queen Marians were everywhere. They were there in the police. They were there in the bar. They were there in media, politics, you name it. So I was standing there once, one, one day, when all of us were gathering and wondering what to do next. Everybody was screaming, shouting and standing around. And the police was called in and there was this lady police inspector. I think she was a sub-inspector. She came, I had met her earlier in one of the meetings on my work. So she said, I will not lay a hand on any of these students. You don't worry ma, because I am an I am also from this college. So as long as you all protest inside, don't come to the Marina Road and sit. Because then I can't do anything. If they order a lati charge, that's it. Because the CM is going to drive down from Secretariat. But all the girls wanted to do exactly that. They would go out and sit on the tarmac. It was hot, melting tar. They sat there. So they diverted the CM's car, I think. Anyway, there was no lati charge. But this was the kind of thing. You don't know who is a Queen Marian. They're everywhere. So that was, uh, finally, we had the papers from the original family which had donated the land. And that was the proof that it was to be used only for women's education. So uh, all the lawyers who were fighting for the college, they won the case. After that, the CM and the acting government was bitter. They didn't do anything for the college. Even during the centenary, they didn't even step in. So all the old students gathered. We did our own book. We did all the events. We fundraised. It was a marvelous effort. And uh, it's something un unforgettable. So we got this other building instead of Kappa House. Once this government went out and the next government came on, we got this huge new building, which was built in a totally different style from the other buildings, of course, but it's very functional. It, it serves a lot of uh, needs. Still, it's a long way to go. We have to save our heritage buildings and precious library. It's a beautiful old library, wood paneled, lovely rare books. And then I can see, every time I go there, uh, heart breaks because you can see the white ants on the ceiling. So you don't know what's happening inside those shelves. And they've increased the numbers enormously. 7,000 girls in two shifts. No, not enough toilets, not enough water. This is the library, this is the, this is the way I want to end because it's not the end. We are out of the woods, but we are hardly up and dry and safe. So what can be done? What, what should be done? How can it be saved? Because this is a precious part of history. Uh, we shouldn't just let things slide. It is true for every heritage thing. 
whatever you are coming across. We all care, we meet, we talk, we enjoy, we go home, we sleep, we forget. That shouldn't be. So this is not the end. We need to save it and we have to extend this kind of feeling about many more places and do something about it. Thank you. We were talking about uh, funds being available, and th those funds can definitely be directed towards uh, renovation of the library or at least of the community. Uh, what about our present chief secretary? She's supposed to be very talented. Funds are not, I never said funds are available to renovate no, the building. Dila he memory la, they have a small amount, which itself we cannot bring without FCRA. See, the college cannot get that fund from abroad. So there are technical problems. I'm told the chief secretary is very open to certain good ideas. So, if, uh, so why don't you talk? Yeah. Huh? Sure, because it belongs to everybody. Whoever has an idea, gather the strength and go after it. I think we should not stop. We should really pester them to do something. That is the I thing. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, there are some, uh, the day Emden bombed Madras, mm. yeah. there are some uh, Images. live reports from the Queen Mary Institute. Yeah. Mm. Can I have the one copy of the book? I brought some copies of the centenary book. Tell us about that. They said there was a, a raid, I mean a, a sort of call for evacuation of the building. I believe there were a lot of these uh, dummy things. They, they, they had dug trenches during the world war and uh, people would be asked to vacate at the building and rush out and come and hide. In fact, when I was doing a heritage walk in 2014, that was this actual year, 100 years, in August, and uh, I thought a lot of outsiders will come. And it so happened that a lot of old Queen Marians came, plus some men and outsiders. As we would walk, normally and when you do heritage walk, you'll be walking, stop at points, talk about it, and everybody will listen to you. In this case, it was a revelation for me and my friend who was doing it. Because suddenly, they will all start telling stories. So we'll be running behind them, and we'll be, we'll be listening to them. They got so excited. This was where the trench was dug, and this is where we hid when, when, when the... Uh, when the attack came, Amma, uh, Amma, college and then everything was blackened out. In fact, the entire building was painted with shiny color so that it won't be visible from the sea. And then uh, blackened windows. So this we are talking about World War before our time, World World War Two. Adhikapra inga war, Emden came around that time. Uh, and then some of the girls jumped out and wanted to go and see where the bomb had fallen. So they, 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 they had uh, hired cycles and cycled up to the port, but they were not allowed inside. High court. Uh, high court. Port. The port. They tried to go. That's what it said in that article. There are a lot of articles in that book, which we actually, Geeta, my co-editor uh, co is here. She's a, she's a senior Queen Marian and... Uh, um, uh, writer, editor, she's done a marvelous job on this and we had a very good guide in uh, the late Anand Lakshmi, you know, uh, very, very senior Queen Marian who passed away. So having her as our uh, sort of buffer, we could fight all the committee members who would say, photo party We had to half volley and kick and keep this book in a separate style and have a souvenir for the other kind of things where you put all the politicians and their messages. We didn't want any of those things in this. So we got away with it. So that was a huge uh, effort and uh, we enjoyed doing it absolutely. Uh, so the book is there, uh, it, it, lots of the copies are, ought to be in college, but I don't know what happened to it. The cost, very generous donations from two senior Queen Marians for the design and printing. Part of it came from the Dilahe family and a lot, lot of friends. We just went around asking all the friends and the old students and they all gave generously and we could print enough copies. Thank you. Any other? Yeah. Yes, Tara. Come. Tara has been a right hand, quiet, quiet right hand, as usual. Uh, 
No, I just want to say a few things. One is, um, I think Della Hay was really, I read that book. I think she was an exceptional woman. And it is in that period, especially Janaki Amal, I think she influenced her, made her go out of, you know, any uh, break, any glass ceilings that may have stopped her. So I think Della Hay deserves the recognition that is there. Second thing is when QMC was sought to be demolished in 2003, I think that was one, one uh, what should I say, incident or event when a wide section of the city's people came together to see that it was not done. And uh, I must actually play, place tribute to Dr. Indra Ramurthy and Dr. B. Ramurthy. Because uh, when I heard she was an old student, I asked her to come there. And she was fantastic. Actually, Dr. Ramurthy was then in a wheelchair. Both of them came. And not only that, she very thoughtfully, the students were there, the, the staff were there. The police were not allowing water to be taken in. That is, they had cut off the water supply. And uh, you know what she did? She had heard about this and she bought a crate of water, bottled water. And she said, I am independence movement. She took two bottles of water in her hand and she walked into that place. And she then her driver and associates walked in. The police just wouldn't do anything. And Dr. Ramurthy came and in a wheelchair and he addressed, addressed them and then told all of them. This is actually, in a sense, he said it's very reminiscent of past history of independence and what happened. So he said, you just have to learn lessons from that as to how to do these things. So to me, it was, it was a remarkable incident of the bravery of b both Dr. Ramurthy and Indra Ramurthy. Then the last one is in the court case. Actually, the Chief Justice of that court here then was not really keen on doing anything about this. But the I think uh, the college, I don't know if the college had filed a case. Um, the the labor lawyers had filed a case. Um, Intac had filed a case. C Consumer Action Group had filed a case. There were about six people who, and the best of the legal minds were there arguing. When the Chief Justice saw the strength and he just couldn't do anything about it. All he could do was not to give, you know, to listen to them and not to give uh, any judgment. And of course, as this happens in Tamil Nadu, the next government that came was very happy to change whatever had done earlier. But I think this was one uh, incident to me that really the city came together and we need more such cooperation on several other things. Lastly, the, the restoration of Pentland House, Jaipur House and uh, Stone House is going on. Actually, before it happened, Intact went there and uh, we uh, spoke to the higher education secretary. And uh, one of the first things we did was, even before you do anything, see, PWD in a sense is outdated on this issue. I am I'm not blaming them, but their concentration has not been on restoration. They ha do now have a separate cell for restoration, but their skills are not upgraded. So what they've actually done, we intact held a two day, uh, no, a single day workshop for them. We taken enormous trouble to collect all the information that they need and get experts to come and talk to them. And we told them that we will prepare 
a detailed project report. Once that project report was there, which would also have technical information on how this was to be done, they could follow it. I mean, the PWD had to actually follow it. But the main thing in many of these things is a commitment to restoration. It is not just the process of building or repair or this thing. It is how you do it and why you do it. But I'm not going to go into those details. But I must tell you that finally, after all this, the higher, we were actually at that point of time doing this for two groups of buildings. One was QMC and one was the Kumbakonam Kumbakonam Arts College, which is where Ramanujam, the mathematician, studied. And they have about eight buildings of, uh, uh, of two, about 200 years old. And uh, the PWD do not want help, advice, etc. I mean, somewhere along the way, they feel I just feel it's a lack of humility in accepting help that stops them from giving help that Freya we are prepared to do and to give them. We have prepared a very good detailed project report for uh, Kumbakonam Arts College. The, the principal there is very keen to see that it happens. Of course, Angi and PWD are going to do it, but at least they can't escape from what has already been given to them. But QMC College, they did not want a DPR to be made by us. We were going to spend, find people who would give us money to prepare the DPR. There was no cost involved to them. But even then, they do not want to accept this. So I do not think that anything will change as far as QMC is concerned. Thank you. It's a building which has been very central to our roads where when we go to Paris or this side, we couldn't have missed it. And uh, we should thank Nitya Balaji for uh, a wonderful informative article, our uh, talk. And uh, you should definitely have a look at that book. It's one of the best books that I've ever seen for a college in uh, Tamil Nadu. So uh, it is a, it's typically a coffee table book. And for a government college, I think it is something very, very new that somebody's attempted that. So I would I'd like to, Mr. Uday of uh, Mystical Pamela, to hand over a small honorarium to the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please, Sam. Yeah. 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 She's been one of the regulars in Mystical Palmara. Mystical Palmara is uh, a group, I would say, uh, founded by Shankaropriya. She is not here. She's traveling. That's why I'm here. Um, they are responsible for identifying heritage sites, historical places, and join hands with them and talk about it. No, I think I'm audible. Yeah, audible. Yeah. You won't be recorded. And then and, and this journey happens at least uh, four times a year. There, there are a lot of Palmerans out there, I would call, at least six of us at least. So we travel together. I don't know why Ramanujan chose to pull me out. There are the veterans there. <laughs> On behalf of both of us. Huh? Thank you. Uh, one small thing is the oldest swimming pool in Madras is within the QMC campus. I don't know whether it has been filled, but a record, history records that the oldest swimming pool came in a ladies' college in Madras. There's something remarkable about of how Madras has been open to people. Just a small announcement. This book costs around 750 rupees per copy. I have a few copies here. We don't want to collect money, Geeta and I. So we've just brought some. Anybody who wants and who would like to have it and share it with other Queen Marians, please take it. Make a donation to the college on your own. So we will not, uh, I mean, whatever you want. Because at that time, all of us paid 1,000 rupees because we wanted to contribute to the college. But the books are there. We don't have too many copies left, but there are a lot of copies in the college, but we don't know who's handling it and where it is. If you haven't seen it, it's really a collector's piece, not because we were involved, but there's so much of history in this place. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.